Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to talk about 2 Corinthians chapters 1 through 7. Now this is tough. This is tough text. It's tough language. They seem to be suffering. They seem to be in affliction. And Paul is going to try and comfort them. And we're going to see little hints and beautiful little things like, for example, for our light affliction, which is but a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's kind of a theme that's flowing through these verses. But I don't know very many people that turn to 2 Corinthians 1 through 7 when they're in distress finding comfort. So the language here is tough. And I know Mike well enough to know that he probably could do a five-hour podcast on the wording and the awkwardness of that verse. You're going to struggle with some of the language, and you're going to say, I'm lost here. So just hold on. We won't cover everything, but we'll cover enough that hopefully it will give you an idea of what's going on and how to see the difficult language of what Paul's tackling. Then we'll jump into kind of the major themes of comfort in affliction, being marked as Christ writing the law in your heart and making sure that your godly sorrow leads you to repentance, not necessarily some other way. I also want to add, if there's a verse that's troubling you or a verse that you're a little bit confused on, the odds are in the show notes we'll unpack some of that. I I spent quite a bit of time translating some of this stuff into English that kind of reads a little bit better than King James, or in my opinion, is a little bit easier. And so some of that is in there as well. Now, the overview of 2 Corinthians is the visit that Paul sent from 1 Corinthians. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 10, he's going to send Timothy to the saints in Corinth. And one of the reasons why is the people in Corinth have a teacher there. There's somebody there who's denying Paul's apostleship, and he's undercutting his authority. And so at least one individual there in Corinth has accepted this individual's arguments and has started to turn the saints in Corinth against Paul urging others to do the same. This troubled Paul so much that he left Ephesus and he went to Corinth for a short visit that seems to be not successful. Now you can read about that in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 14 and in the first two verses of chapter 13 of 2 Corinthians. He promises to return to them. That's in 2 Corinthians 1.16. But then he tells them he's decided to postpone his visit because he's worried that it's going to cause them even more pain. He says that in a couple places. And so he wants to go back, but he realizes if he does, it's going to cause pain. Now think about that in your life. Have you delayed difficult conversations with people because you're worried about the pain it might cause? There are some things that Paul's going to be saying in 2 Corinthians that is going to make them sad. It's going to cut deep. And a lot of philosophers in Paul's day would liken tough conversations to going into a surgeon or a doctor. Sometimes a doctor or a surgeon would have to cut you to take out whatever it was that was bad, and that caused pain, but the pain made it worth it because you got better. And so Paul's having those kind of feelings as he's writing some of these things in 2 Corinthians. Now, back when he is in Ephesus, he was in danger of his life. And then he wrote a severe letter out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 7. And then he sends this letter to the saints in Corinth by the hand of Titus. At some point in Paul's ministry, he hears news that the troubles of the church in Corinth are starting to be fixed. He's probably getting this information when he's in Philippi. And so in this context, we think he's writing 2 Corinthians when he's in Philippi and he's hearing news about the individual who's causing the problems, that that person is being disciplined. We're going to talk about this. The the individual we think that's causing problems back in 1 Corinthians, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's this individual causing problems there. We think that might be the same person. We're not sure. But whatever it is, 
the individual who's causing problems in Corinth has been disciplined. And so in this context, we think Paul is in Philippi, which is in Macedonia, that he receives this information. And so he writes to them, 2 Corinthians. And in this, especially in today's Come Follow Me material, a big bulk of 1 through 7 is Paul defending his ministry and his apostleship and also encouraging the Corinthian saints to raise funds for the poor in Jerusalem. Now that's going to actually be part of chapters 8 and 9. We'll get into that next week. But he's also preparing for a third visit to the saints in Corinth. Now this letter that he's writing to them in 2 Corinthians is going to be sent to them by Titus. And you know we're not really sure when, but probably somewhere in the 50s AD. And so the main message of this week's Come Follow Me in 2 Corinthians is Paul defending his apostolic authority testifying of its authenticity, not only his calling, but the gospel of Jesus Christ and Jesus's ministry. He's addressing challenges and criticisms that he's faced from his opponents. He's going to talk about his sufferings, the hard things that he's gone through for the sake of the gospel, and he's going to emphasize some themes of God's comfort to the saint in times of affliction and the glory of the covenant. He's going to talk about reconciliation. That that word is going to come up again in here, and we're going to talk about that. It's related to the atonement. So big picture, his aim is to strengthen them, but he's also discussing issues with this individual that's causing problems in the church. In the opening of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul talks about God sending comfort in tough times. He's going to emphasize the comforting nature of God who's going to bring solace and support to believers when they're having tough times. I really like verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. I really like this on many levels. One of them is because Paul is in the midst of tribulation. He has gone through so many things. We've talked about many of his tribulations in the book of Acts, and here he's, he's testifying of God's ability to comfort even in times of great stress. And so in order to emphasize this theme of comfort, in verses 8 through 11... Paul shares some personal experiences with the congregation there in Corinth. He endured suffering when he was there in Corinth, and his suffering was even more intense when he was in Asia, specifically in Ephesus. If you remember, the account in Acts chapters 19 verses 1 to 20 verse 1 talked about his ministry there. After three months, certain members of the synagogue refused to believe him, and they publicly spoke against the way. That's Acts chapter 19, verse 9. These unbelievers put a ton of pressure on Paul, and this part in Acts talks about the riot that the silversmiths took out against Paul. Remember, Paul's teaching of Jesus kind of hurt their sales because they were trying to sell images to the goddess Artemis, and that caused the problems there in the book of Acts. And so Paul has had some personal experience there with struggling with opposition. And then in verses 15 through 22 of Acts chapter 1, Paul discusses with the saints in Corinth that he's going to change his travel plans. He was planning on coming, but there's going to be a change of plans. In 15 and 16, he says, In this confidence, I was minded to come to you before that you might have a second benefit and to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia unto you and of you to be brought on my way towards Judea. So his plan was to come, but he shifted plans. And he says that in verse 17. It's kind of rough in the English, but essentially what he's saying is, the Spirit is leading me to come not now, but to come later. And now an early Christian commentator, his name is John Chrysostom, uh, that means golden mouth. John Chrysostom was a bishop in Constantinople. He was there in the fourth century, and he wrote this. The carnal man who is riveted to the present world and completely caught up in it is outside the sphere of the Spirit's influence and has the power to go everywhere doing whatever he likes. But the servant of the Spirit is led by the Spirit. He cannot just do what he likes. He is dependent on the Spirit's authority. 
Paul was not able to come to Corinth because it was not the Spirit's will for him to go there. It's difficult in the King James. I'm just acknowledging this. But what Paul is saying to them is, I'm going to come to you guys, but not yet. And there probably were some people in Corinth that were disappointed over his delay. And some of them might have made an argument like this. Hey, if Paul's word was not dependable when he told us he was going to come here, maybe we can't trust his message. And maybe he's not reliable. And Paul's going to defend his message and his reliability and his ministry. And that's going to be throughout two all the way to seven. He's going to defend his ministry and the gospel and the message that he has. That's a big bulk of this week's Come Follow Me. But with his change in travel plans, he also mentions this. He says in verse 20 of chapter 1, For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. So there's a couple things that Paul is emphasizing here, and he's saying this. I have been anointed, I have been sealed, and I have been given the erobon, or the earnest. That erobon, or the earnest, stands for earnest money. If you bought a house, you have to bring a chunk of money to go buy that house. That earnest money is used to show the bank you're serious about purchasing the house. This Erebon that God has given Paul is the Spirit. And so what I think he's saying is this. Hey, you guys in Corinth, you can trust my message. You felt the Spirit. That Spirit is God showing you that there's a greater thing to come. That is the earnest money that God has given you to prove to you that this message is valuable. And in Paul's defense, he says, I've been anointed, verse 21, I've been sealed, verse 22, and I've received the Erebon, or the earnest money of God, which is his Holy Spirit. And so you can stand in the faith. Okay, chapter two. In my opinion, this chapter underscores the need for us to forgive each other and to have reconciliation with those that have wronged us. Now think about this. President Nelson has talked about this recently, that we need to find ways to forgive. The message here is revolving around a specific situation involving a disciplinary action that was taken out in the Corinthian church. Paul is going to urge the Corinthian saints to forgive and restore the repentant individual who caused the problems in the community. Now, Who was this person that was this offender that Paul encouraged the saints in Corinth to forgive? I think this is involving the individual who is the offender in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was an individual there causing problems, and he was unrepentant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 6, essentially what Paul is talking about is this individual who caused the grief, this guy has suffered enough. So what is it that we need to do? Verse 8. I beseech you that you would confirm your love towards him. Now, right after he talks about, hey, you guys need to forgive this individual, Paul gets into his journeyings. Now, you'll read this in verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Now that's where Philippi is. We actually put a map in the show notes if you want to look at it and see what he's talking about. But right there, you might want to put a little star right next to that word Macedonia. Because right after Paul's talking about going into Macedonia in verse 13, he goes on a tangent that in my opinion is one of the bigger tangents in scripture. The tangent is going to last all the way to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. So from 2.14 all the way to 7, verse 4 is a tangent. And the tangent that Paul is going to go on is a defense of his ministry, a defense of God and his gospel. Paul is trying to convince the saints in Corinth that he's the real deal. 
and that you guys in Corinth need to stop listening to these people that are trying to undercut the apostolic authority that we have, and you need to listen to the true messengers. And this tangent is going to cover a lot of different aspects of the truth of Paul's message. And then when you get to chapter 7, verse 4, he'll pick it up again with his journey in Macedonia, and he will continue on his narrative. But just know that from 2.13 all the way to 7, verse 4 of 2 Corinthians, that's one big tangent that Paul is going to go on. And that's where I perk up. That's where he starts to speaking to my soul is some of these tangent addresses where he's kind of defending who he is and what he's talking about. And I love kind of the messages that you find in these verses. For example, I think what's going on here is old Paul versus new Paul. And I'm guessing they're criticizing new Paul. And they're wishing he was old Paul. That's just my suspicion. And Paul's defending new Paul, what's happened to him since he was an ardent defender of the law of Moses. So he's going to get into several arguments about old Paul or old law and new Paul or new law. For example, I love chapter 3, verse 3. This is one of my absolute favorite verses of Paul's writings, and that is that Look, the old law was very stringent, and it had to be written in stone. That's the only way it could be enforced, is if the law was written in stone and kind of banged over our head, and it served a purpose. But the new law isn't that. And those of you who like that written in stone and clearly spelled out and tell me everything I need to do are going to struggle with the new law because the new law is written somewhere else. And I love the language here. 2 Corinthians 3, 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. In other words, the new law isn't really written in the stone, and it's not even written in the books. The new law is written in us for everyone to see. I manifest the law of Christ more than any book does. It's dead if it doesn't live in me. It's one thing to hand a book to someone and say, here, read this. This Book of Mormon will tell you everything you need to know. But what gives power to missionary work is the life of the one who's handing the book. If I just simply pass over a book and say, read this and expect them to be converted, I'm most likely not going to see that. But if my life is an example of what's written in the book, that's what they're going to see. Elder Holland emphatically said, people do not join the church because of what they know. They join because of what they feel, what they see, and want spiritually. And it's that second one. People join the church because of what they see. I am that message. I think we need to understand that, that today the law of Christ lives in me, and I am his epistle. I am the book. When the Lord spoke to Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni before their mission, he emphatically said, you go forth and show them good examples. And wasn't it Ammon's good example that caught the attention of Lamoni? Before they ever had a religious discussion, Ammon won his heart by the way he lived. And so when Paul says, you are declared to be the epistle of Christ, I think we need to understand that is a heavy responsibility. My life is the Savior's message to the people around me. My happiness, my joy, my peace, what they sense in my life is his message to them. Now, it can't be written in ink. I love the rest of verse 3. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. Now, that suggests to me that I need to have the law written in my heart. And if it's written in my heart and I live it, not because I have to, but because it's written in my heart. Can you sense the difference between law of Moses? Well, you have to do it because it says right here. 
and the law of Christ. No, I do it because I want to. I desire to. I want to please him. I love how President Benson said it this way. When obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment, God will endow us with power. I think I can tell when the law is written in a person's heart, because obedience ceases to become a uh, have to, I do it out of duty, it's my responsibility, I feel guilty if I don't, and becomes a quest. It's a quest, it's a desire. The law is written into the very desires of my heart, and I want to live it. That, to me, is the sign that the law is written in the heart. Now, that is the moment that I become the epistle. I become God's message to the world. Do you remember last year when we talked about the Abrahamic covenant and our responsibility to make his name known in all the world? We do that by the way we live. That's this tangent that Paul's going on. And I love how he picks it up in chapter 6. Still on the tangent, I'm going to jump to chapter 6 a little bit out of order. But in chapter 6, verse 4, he says, "...in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. My life is his message." Now listen to this list. "...I prove myself as a minister of God in much patience, in affliction." in necessities, in distresses. How I respond in times of affliction and necessity and distress when patience is required of me is not only my greatest sermon to the world, but God's epistle to them through me. My life is his epistle. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, and by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. I think every one of us needs to hear what Paul is trying to say, that in these latter days, the law is not written on stone tablets. How I live my everyday life, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fasting. How I live my life is his epistle. Now, do you remember how many times in the Book of Mormon it makes a commentary that it was the example of the members of the church that were the biggest stumbling blocks? I can lead people to Christ or away from Christ by how I live my life. Alma will say to his son Corianton, how much wickedness he brought upon the Zoramites. For when they saw your conduct, they would not believe my words. Do you see what Paul's teaching? Only when the gospel is written in our hearts can my life's message teach with power and conviction. In 2 Corinthians 3, after he does talk about the law of Moses, the comparison between the New Testament and the Old Testament, and Moses and the gospel, he says in verse 14 that the veil is done away in Christ. I think Paul's referring back to the tearing of the veil that occurred when Jesus laid down his life. I really read it that way. And then he says that the veil shall be taken away. In verse 17, he says, the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now, if you remember, Paul talked about that earlier, seeing as it were through a glass darkly. We discussed that in the context 
of a veil type scene where the individual is brought into God's presence. I really like to read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 in connection with those ideas. We connected them to the message of Moroni in chapter 7 of the Book of Mormon. After discussing the fact that the peaceable ones are to lay hold upon every good thing in Moroni 7 verses 20 and 21, the sons of God are to pray with all the energy of their heart to be filled with the pure love of Christ. That's Moroni 7 48. And why do they do this? They do this so that they may receive charity and that they may become the sons of God. Why? Because when Jesus appears, Moroni says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and we will be purified even as he is pure. That's Moroni 7 verse 48. So I see all of these ideas swirling around in Moroni chapter 7 tied into the macro message of chapter 3, which is this idea that the Old Testament or the messages therein pointed us to Christ. Paul rereads the Old Testament and he sees Jesus everywhere. He understands that the veil is done away in Christ. That's verse 14. And because of this, the Spirit of the Lord brings us into this liberty where we approach God and we have ourselves changed, our image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. I think Paul has been initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom, and Paul is talking about this idea that the Old Testament pointed us to Christ, the veil was done away in his atonement, and we are being invited into God's presence. Now, in the fourth chapter, he's going to discuss this idea that the eternal glory that we are to receive will outweigh all of our challenges. And if there's anybody who knows anything about challenges and hardships, it's going to be Paul. He knows all about this. And so essentially, he's going to say in this chapter that despite their afflictions, the saints are not to be destroyed, but that they also are invited to participate in the sufferings of Christ. So just because the law is written in my heart doesn't mean my life is going to be easy. That was never the intention. And we don't get a pass from trial because we choose to follow Christ. He is going to take us through our own Gethsemane. Our lives are going to be tested. That is a gospel truth. That is part of this mortality. So following Christ doesn't free you of trial and affliction. However, following Christ brings help in those trials. You are going to face them. And we need to all remember that trial is not evidence that God does not love me, like so many people conclude. Do you remember the mist of darkness that blinded eyes and hardened hearts? Mists of darkness blind us to the love of God. Trial is often perceived as a mist of darkness. People in pain often conclude that God has abandoned them. But pain and trial are not evidences that God has left us. It's evidence that we're in a mortal existence and we need to be tested and tried. So don't think, I think Paul is trying to reiterate this to all of us, don't think that living a life of Christ is going to free you of trial and challenge. It won't. In fact, it may intensify those trials and challenges as he refines your soul even more. So... Why do we do it? Why walk the journey with Christ if it's not going to free us of the pain? It's because it's going to strengthen us. Now, President Nelson gave an entire talk on the fact that living a life of Christ is easier than living a life without Christ. Now, that's not because the weight of the trial is lessened. It's because we have been strengthened to bear the burden. It's not that the burden got lighter. It's that my ability to carry the load was increased with his help. Therefore, Paul says what we all are going to say if we follow Christ. Starting in verse 7 of chapter 4, he says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not me. It's not me. And because of that, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, 
persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Why? Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. His atoning sacrifice brings strength to deal with our challenges. It doesn't make them go away, and it doesn't lighten the burden. It simply makes it appear lighter because we have been significantly strengthened. Let me read a Book of Mormon passage that I think is teaching what Paul's trying to teach. When Alma the elder left the priests of Noah, much to the chagrin of the other priests who then hated him, he ends up being overseen by Amulon, one of the other priests and the Lamanites, who put tasks upon them, makes their life miserable. And in the middle of that, the Lord speaks to them. This is God speaking to a group of people who are in pain. And the Lord said, lift up your heads. I'm reading from Mosiah chapter 24, 13 through 15. Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which you have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. Now, delivery is another day. Today's not delivery day. Today is strengthened day. I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. Now, how he does that is the next verse, but this is the result of doing that. And this I will do that you may stand as witnesses of me hereafter. Think what Paul has just taught about me being the epistle of God. And that you may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. Now, it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. How? How does the Lord make our burden light? Yea, the Lord did strengthen them that they could bear up their burdens with ease. And they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord." That's what Paul's trying to teach. Be a chosen vessel. Carry the message of God. Follow Christ and be a message to the world. But doing so is not going to free you of challenge. What it will do is bring strength to handle those challenges so that when you are troubled, you won't be distressed. When you're perplexed, you won't be in despair. When you're persecuted, you won't feel forsaken. When you're cast down by the world, you won't be destroyed. That's a beautiful message. I really like how it ends. In verse 17, he writes, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, I don't know if he's doing this on purpose, but Paul might be doing some punning right here in verse 17 because the word for weight and the word for glory is the same word in Hebrew. That word kavod is like this heaviness or this weight or glory. I think for sure he's playing with ideas that the Corinthian saints would understand in verse 18. Look what he says. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In Paul's day, uh, there was a teacher named Plato that spent a lot of time talking about what is real. And in Paul's day, many of these individuals, they were called Platonists, they thought that the bodily things were heavy and weighed down by the soul, and they thought that the soul was light. And so once freed by our body's death, their belief was that the soul would soar up to the pure heavens from which it had originated. Paul here is probably using these ideas, but he's inverting them. He's reversing them. And he takes that image and that play on words that a few of his Jewish readers that knew Hebrew probably totally understood. And then he's going to take Plato and play with these ideas to teach the gospel. So what's he, what is he doing? He's meeting them where they are, using their language, and then teaching them truth, truths about Jesus. Now, in my calling, I'm, I'm a mission prep 
teacher. And in mission prep, we did a role play where we were talking about feeling the spirit and the importance of feeling the spirit and the importance of taking the sacrament. And I had the missionaries role play it. And one individual taught, she said, hey, you know how when you use your phone all day and then at the end of the day, the battery's low, you need to recharge the batteries. And like that wasn't ever anything that I ever used on my mission, but I was watching her do this and I thought, you're doing what Paul's doing. You're using the language of people in their day to teach gospel truths. Paul would never talk about recharging your battery on your phone, but today that's kind of our language. So Paul's using this language. You see, Plato in Paul's day, Plato believed that the world of ideas was real and unchanging, whereas the temporal changing world is this world of the sense of knowledge, and to him it was only a world of shadows. The world that you and I live in, in, in Plato's conception, was the world of shadows. we got to go back and read the allegory of the cave. Uh, we'll put some stuff in the show notes if this interests some of you. Paul doesn't deny the reality of the visible world, but he does agree that it is subject to decay. The world we live in is a world of death and decay. But to Paul, the unseen world is eternal. So what is Paul doing? He's acknowledging the reality of both worlds, this world and the eternal world. And he's using the ideas that the people in Corinth would have understood, and he's raising their sights to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I really see him doing this. Which goes right into chapter 5, verse 1. Paul didn't write with chapter breaks. Those are later editions. And so he goes right into chapter 5, verse 1, and says that very thing. And we might as well begin with the third verse of, Come, come ye saints, and should we die before our journeys through, happy day, all is well. We then are free from sin and toil too, with the saints we shall dwell. And Paul says it this way, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So as the world around you decays, that's okay, because we hope for a better world, a better world in the eternities, in God's plan, a kingdom waits for us. So in the midst of this conversation about the two worlds, the world of the temporal and the world of the eternal, notice what he says in verse 2. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon, we're back to this endowment image, being clothed with sacred vestments. Paul's going to use the term in duo throughout the text. Uh, put on Christ, put on the armor of light. That idea is to be clothed with sacred vestments. So back to the text, look what he says desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven, if so, be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. And then he talks about, once again, the Erebone, or the earnest of the Spirit. Look in verse 5. He that has wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who has given unto us the Erebone, the earnest money of the Spirit. So I think what Paul's saying is, this is a deposit. God is saying, when he sends his Spirit to you, he is saying to you, you are valuable. You are my son or my daughter. I love you, and this is my pledge, this is my arabone, that I have a mansion for you, that I have a place for you. That pledge, that arabone, is the Holy Ghost. So when you feel the Holy Ghost, that is a direct communication, an invitation to come to that space. And now we're still here in this mortal world. And we have to deal with that. And in doing that, we, you know, Paul uses this phrase, we groan. And this really reminds me of a story that was swirling around in early Christianity that's not in our canonized text, and it's called the Hymn of the Pearl. 
It is part of a writing known as the Acts of Thomas. It's an apocryphal text that doesn't make it into the Bible, but it discusses the cosmic myth, the message of the cosmic myth. It's essentially the story of a prince who leaves his heavenly father and his heavenly mother and his heavenly home, and he comes to earth, and he has to remember who he is. And it's called the Hymn of the Pearl because he needs to find the pearl, and he needs to be clothed with the heavenly robe that he had when he was in heaven. But because he's on earth and he's lost his way, he's forgotten who he is. And he needs to remember who he is, find the pearl, which could be a metaphor for his purpose in life, and return to his heavenly father and his heavenly mother. It really is a good story. I think personally that the hymn of the pearl should be read as part of our sacred text. Because it really does teach this idea that we left our heavenly home, we groan while we're on earth, we're kind of in this lost and fallen condition, but the goal is that we come back. And Bryce and I have a couple friends, Lori Driggs, Tish Kamba, and Mandy Green, that have put together a beautifully illustrated and simplified rendition of this ancient story, the Hymn of the Pearl. And if this is something that's interesting to you, we have a link in our show notes, and it's adapted for an audience of younger readers so that they can read the hymn of the pearl in language that we all understand. And I think Paul's using, whether or not he knows of that story, he's using those images here. And he talks about this. He even starts in verse 1 with Oidemen, where he says, we know about our earthly house, but we know we have one in the heavens. We know this stuff. Which kind of leads to the last part of chapter 5, the reason there is a building in heaven for us is because God has reconciled us to himself. And that's what Paul's going to talk about, is that reconciliation. I love verses 17 through 18. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Paul continues, and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now that word, to be reconciled is a combination of three words. We have re, con, and cilio. Cilio is to sit, con is with, and re is again. So that word can be read as to sit again with. Paul is introducing this idea that we are to sit again with God. Now, the main idea with that word reconciliation is katalage. And that is a word that's used in financial situations in the Greek world. And it's where you have a reckoning of the books. If I owe Bryce money, I have to sit down at the end of the day or at the end of the term and we square up the books so we know where we are. And that katalage is the word that also is used, and it's only four times in the King James, it's used for the word atonement. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 is so important to me, and I think a better translation is, as in that God was in Christ, a world reconciling to himself, not recounting to them their trespasses, and having placed in us the doctrine of the atonement. You see, that idea in the Greek is that God isn't going to sit down and rehash all the stuff that I did wrong. That's literally how I read it in the Greek. What he's saying is because the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ is placed in me, I personally am being reconciled to God through his son. I just love that. We forgive others and Jesus forgives us. We show grace to the people that have hurt us. And in so doing, we become reconciled to them as we are reconciled to God. To me, This verse, verse 19, but especially all of verses 17 through 21, is awesome stuff. It's really, really cool to me in the Greek. And all those phrases where he's talking about being reconciled, it's all kind of coming from this idea of katalage. We're going to sit down, and we're going to be together, and we're going to square it up, and we're going to fix it. And then we read verse 21. 
For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I mean, this is the ultimate irony, isn't it? Jesus was made sin. The person who knew no sin was made sin so that I could be like Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sin, took all of our sins so that we could be sin-free. That's exactly what it means to be reconciled, is he took it from us. He wears it so that we don't. The person who wore white met the person who's wearing red. And now the person who was wearing white is now wearing red so that the person wearing red can now wear white. It's such a powerful verse. He made himself sin so that I could be saved. I mean, it's back to Isaiah, right? Though your sins be as scarlet, yeah. they shall be as white as snow. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff. Now, before we leave chapter 5, I just want to say this. There's a lot going on with verse 12, and we're not going to break it down for this podcast, but if you're one of those people that is like, okay, I really want to know what is going on here, Go to the show notes, and we give you some really good answers to what's going on with verse 12. I don't think it's the main message here, but I think it's important. When I read a verse and I don't understand it, I just can't stop puzzling on it until I can kind of untangle some of the knots, but I don't think verse 12 is the main part of of chapter 5. Now, notice how he transitions out of 5 and into 6. So we are being reconciled. Christ is going to take our sins. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. If we know the atonement, if the law is written in our hearts, we now have to be the message to everyone else. See how that transitions into chapter 6, that we are ministers of Christ in patience, in affliction, in necessities, in distresses. So if you have tasted and known the goodness of Jesus— then take it upon yourself to draw other people to Christ. By the way you live your life, be an ambassador for Christ. I like that. I think that's important. In chapter 6, verse 11, Paul says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open to you, our heart is enlarged. What Paul is essentially saying is, hey, I'm going to be a straight shooter with you guys, and I'm going to be totally open with you. And then he says this in verse 12, ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. I got to tell you, I think verse 12, in my opinion, in the King James, can be kind of difficult reading. One, one scholar, Craig Keener, renders this translation. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. I think if we look at this as a metaphor, if, if you look at some of the phrases that Paul's using in the Greek, these are euphemistic for passion or affection. And I really like Dr. Keener's translation here. In essence, what he's saying in verse 12, and I think a better translation is, hey, you guys are the ones withholding affection. I'm being a straight shooter. And so then look what he says in verse 13. I speak to you guys as I would speak to my own children. And then for the rest of the chapter, chapter 6, he talks about not being unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I think the bulk of this teaching here in verses 14 through 18 have to do with the problems that we discussed at the opening of the podcast, that there were those that were undercutting apostolic authority, and Paul is essentially calling them out. And he's saying, hey, listen, you guys have to decide who you're going to listen to. What voices are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the apostles and the servants who we have sent to you to teach you the gospel of Christ? Or are you going to listen to these detractors? And if you choose to listen to these detractors, you are going to not be in light, but you'll have communion with darkness, and you have to decide. Now, I also understand that traditionally in Latter-day Saint teaching, often we have used these verses to talk about not being married to those outside of our faith. And I understand that teaching and that concept. I think historically in the context of Paul's discussion to the Corinthian saints, I don't think this is a discussion about marriage. I think this is a discussion that he's having with them specifically about what voices are they going to listen to. And I think there's a bigger lesson here as well. 
I love to take what Paul said to a specific audience and then connect it to larger, grander truths as well that are applicable to us. So I'm not trying to say this is what Paul was trying to teach the Corinthians, but this is a powerful application I have found in my life using the words of Paul. So he's saying, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And then he seems to be saying, look, good and evil are not equals. Some people have the idea that evil is as strong in the arena of evil as good is in the arena of good. That evil's strength is a 10 towards evil and good's strength is a 10 towards good. And that is absolutely not true. Satan isn't as powerful in evil as God is in good. There is absolutely no comparison between the two. Now, I know what Joseph Smith felt when Satan attacked him was a very real thing, and he knew that he could potentially be destroyed. But the moment the light came, that was gone. They didn't struggle back and forth and light won. The moment the light came, evil was gone. And I love how Paul says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness. They are not equal partners just going different directions. What communion hath light with darkness? Again, they are not equal partners just headed in different directions. Light has so much more power. Think about being in a dark room, a completely dark room. How much light would it take to repel the greatest amount of darkness? They are not equals. You don't have to have as much light as you have darkness for the light to win over. The smallest amount of light repels even the greatest amount of darkness. So Paul says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? That is not a comparison. Let me illustrate with one of my favorite books. C.S. Lewis wrote the book called The Great Divorce. It has nothing to do with marriage. It's the divorce of heaven and hell. Someone in his day had suggested that there is really no difference that eventually hell becomes heaven. And his point was, no, there is a massive difference between them. They are not equally yoked. And his whole book is trying to talk about the difference between heaven and hell. The story is a group of ghosts from hell go on vacation to heaven. And they are invited to stay as long as they let go of the one thing they're holding on to that's keeping them in hell. Every single one of them that comes on the bus to heaven gets back on the bus except for one. Only one stays. And that's a story for another day. But there are escorts that come down from heaven to encourage them. People in their lives, their past lives on earth that will encourage them to stay. And you get to hear a little bit of a conversation between them, between the ghost and the escort, and it becomes obvious what they're holding on to that's keeping them in hell. Well, towards the end of the book, there is a conversation between a woman who obviously made mistakes in her marriage, but repented and made it into heaven. Her husband has now gone to hell. So a woman in heaven is reaching out to try and convince her husband, who's in hell, to stay in heaven. She pleads for his forgiveness. She begs him to stay. But he ends up walking away. He goes back to hell and leaves her in heaven. That promotes a little discussion about the difference between heaven and hell amongst C.S. Lewis, who's kind of the main character, and his mentor. I just want to read that conversation because it's a beautiful illustration of how weak hell is compared to heaven. So the main character says to his guide, you say it will go down to the lowest, sir, but she didn't go down to hell with him. She didn't even see him off by the bus. Well, where would you have had her go? Why, where we all came by that bus, the big gulf 
beyond the edge of the cliff over there. You can't see it here from here, but you must know the place I mean. He's referring to when they came into heaven, the bus came up through this massive gulf. And he's saying, well, why didn't she go to the gulf? It's got to be over there. You've got to know where it is. Now watch what his teacher does. My teacher gave a curious smile. Look, he said, and with the word he went down on his hands and knees, I did the same and presently saw that he had plucked a blade of grass. Using its thin edge as a pointer, he made me see, after I had looked very closely, a crack in the soil, so small that I could not have identified it without his aid. I cannot be certain, he said, that this is the crack you came up through. But through a crack no bigger than that, ye certainly came. Now, let me just interject. Do you understand? This guy came through a massive chasm, and his teacher is saying it was nothing but a crack in heaven. But but I guess with a feeling of bewilderment, not unlike terror, I saw an infinite abyss, the cliffs towering up and up, and then this country on top of the cliffs. Yes. But the voyage was not merely locomotion. That bus and all you inside it were increasing in size. Do you mean then that hell, all that infinite empty town, is down in some little teeny crack like this? Yes. All hell is smaller than one pebble of your earthly world but it is smaller than one atom of this world, the real world. Look at yon butterfly. If it swallowed all of hell, hell would not be big enough to do it any harm or to have any taste. It sure seems big enough when you're in it, sir. Yes. And yet all loneliness, angers, hatreds, envies, and itchings that it contains, if rolled into one single experience and put into the scale against the least moment of the joy that is felt by the least in heaven, would have no weight that could be registered at all. Bad cannot succeed even in being bad as truly as good is good. If all hell's miseries together entered the conscience of yon ye yellow bird on bough there, they would be swallowed up without trace, as if one drop of ink had been dropped into that great ocean to which your terrestrial Pacific itself is only a molecule. That is what we have to understand. Now, I love where he goes next. The woman could not fit into hell to chase her husband. And so then the teacher says, speaking of people who do go to hell, for a damned soul is nearly nothing. It is shrunk, shut up in itself. Good beats upon the damned incessantly as sound waves beat on the ears of the deaf, but they cannot receive it. Their fists are clenched, their teeth are clenched, their eyes fast shut. First they will not, in the end they cannot open their hands for gifts, or their mouths for food, or their eyes to see. Then no one can ever reach them? Only, only the greatest of all can make himself small enough to enter hell. For the higher a thing is, the lower it can descend. A man can sympathize with a horse, but a horse cannot sympathize with a rat. Only one has descended into hell. I just love that. Good is so much more triumphant than evil. Joy is is so much larger than pain or affliction. They are not equals. 
and we need to not consider them equals in terms of temptation, in terms of attention, in terms of what I let into my life. The joy of the gospel will completely swallow up the pebbles of pain. They are not equally yoked. And I love how Paul concludes this. Ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. But what do we got to do? Verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. Unclean things will not give you anything compared to what goodness will give you. And it really does carry over into the seventh chapter because in verse one, Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And why? To become holy. And so then he continues with his message about receiving apostolic witnesses. Look what he says. In verse 2, he says, Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. By the way, that's a lot of fun in the Greek. And that word for receive us, it comes from this idea of a circle. And I, and I like to think about the early Christians would pray in a circle. And he's basically saying, hey, and, and that word in the Greek also is connected to that word for chorus, a circle of people singing a song. Make room for us is probably a better translation. For we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. Let the apostles into your circle. Make room for us. The English is receive us, but there's so much more going on there. And then he says, I'm not doing this to you guys to condemn you. I'm doing it to save you. I'm filled with comfort, and I'm exceedingly joyful in all your tribulation. And that's the end of his tangent. In verse 5 of chapter 7, he picks up where he left off back in chapter 2, where he's talking about his trip to Macedonia. So everything from 2.14 to 7.4 is that message. Hey, listen to the true witnesses. I have credentials, Paul's saying. I am an apostle, and I know what you guys are going through. Listen to us. We will lead you in the ways of life and salvation. And then chapter 7 picks up where it left off, where he's talking about his trip to Macedonia, being comforted when he meets up with Titus. And then he says in verse 8, hey, I know I made you sorry with a letter. And really, this carries over to other parts of his message in 2 Corinthians, where he says, hey, I'm glad that it made you sorry. One of the things that makes Paul glad is that knowing that his message to them caused them to be sorrowful proves that they accept his apostolic authority. It proves that they understand who he is. And so then he has this discussion in chapter 7 about godly sorrow leading to repentance. He says in verse 10, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. And he's happy that they have listened to his message and have cleaned up the mess that was going on in Corinth because they had godly sorrow. Now, there's two types of sorrows for sin, and the scriptures speak of them frequently. Let's talk about the law of agency. The law of agency says if you make right choices according to the law that God has given, those are the right choices. If you make right choices, it brings freedom. If you make wrong choices, it brings captivity. And sometimes that captivity brings pain or embarrassment. So there are two types of sorrows. One sorrow is when you are sorry for the consequences. You're sorry that you're embarrassed. I'm sorry that you found out about my transgression and I'm ashamed. Are you sorry for the consequences, the embarrassment or the shame of having done something wrong? Or are you sorry for the choice you made? Those are the two sorrows. If you are sorry for the choice you made, then the next time you face that choice, you will not make that same choice. You will change your behavior. You will repent. 
I'm sorry for the choice I made. I'm sorry that I broke the commandment. Rather than, I'm sorry that you found out about it and now I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry I made the choice. And if no one else finds out about it, I'm still going to change the choice because I'm sorry for the choice. That's godly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is I'm sorry for the consequences. I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that you know. Because if you're sorry for the consequences, the next time that choice comes around, you're going to say to yourself, well, I'm just going to be better. I'm going to be smarter this time. I'll make the same choice, but I'll make sure I don't get caught this time. I'll be smarter. Well, you're making the same bad choice. It's only when you're sorry for the choice you've made that your behavior is going to change. This is how Mormon words it in the Book of Mormon. He saw his people sorrowing, and he got excited that maybe they would repent. But then he says, My joy was vain, for their sorrowing was not unto repentance because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. Godly sorrow is when, independent of anyone finding out or knowing or facing the consequences of my sin, I am sorry that I chose poorly. And thus Paul says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. The sorrow of the world worketh death, because I keep choosing captivity over freedom. May we be sorry for the bad choices we've made. May we write the law in our hearts, on the fleshy tables of our hearts, so that we live it out of choice, out of desire, not out of obligation. May we be the epistle of Christ to everyone around us. May they know who God is because they know us. May we be those ministers. And with that, we thank you for your time. We will see you next week when we talk about 2 Corinthians chapters 8 through 13. Make it a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.